Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, good morning. My name is Arkady Retic. I'm uh, the chair for this session. I also be chairing the session this afternoon. And if you probably figure out this session is one of the uniting theme of the session, it's education. And the same will be afternoon. So uh, we have three presentations. And we have four more presentations related to education uh, this afternoon. Before we go to this particular session, just a very short announcement. If you register, and especially for those faculty who come who are not Microsoft people, if you register for this conference within last week, or you couldn't register because the registration was closed, more specifically, please uh, pass uh, your email account to registration because I think we're going to give to everyone the faculty outside access to Azure uh, for test environment, so do encourage you to register and give your email, otherwise you'll miss this offer, okay? Now, uh, as far as the presentation, we have very, three very interesting presentations today. The three of them are about education and uh, about using the cloud to contribute specifically to university and teaching. One is toward predictable cloud computing by Andreas Pauls. Then will be cloud for university city campus by Daniela Montesi. And the last one by Harold Castro on cloud computing project in engineering. So the first one is by Professor Andreas Pauls. Actually, this presentation is by, submitted by two people. Also, uh, uh, Alexander Schmidt here, who will be presenting another paper afternoon. Andres, who will be presenting, he is a professor at, uh, in operating system in middleware at uh, Hasso Plattner Institute for Software Engineering. This is part of University of Potsdam in Germany. Andres also uh, head of uh, postgraduate a PhD school on service-oriented engineering uh, there. Andres has very distinguished record and he did the research and teaching in many places, not only in Germany, but also in the US, Carnegie Mellon and Urbana, Illinois, and other things. He is author of many papers. Uh, very interestingly enough, Andreas also took part in several uh, Microsoft projects and technologies like Rotor, Phoenix, and one, the last one is Windows Research Kernel. Actually, he was very active and was a co-author of Curriculum Resource Kit that helps to introduce operating system teaching into universities. Uh, part of this is also a contribution to Windows Research Kernel. It's a source code offering for Microsoft with build environment. Uh, Andreas Group did a lot of research, and I believe part of his uh, presentation experience will be about this. So please welcome Andreas. Yeah, so just uh, to let you know, we, every presentation is 20 minutes. I'll give a sign, and then five minutes we will leave for questions. All right. Thank you. Okay, thanks for your introduction, Alkari. Um, and title of presentation today is Towards Predictable Cloud Computing. And I want to start with uh, this agenda today. First, I want to talk very, very briefly about the Hasselblad Institute and our group there and what we are doing in terms of research. Um, then I'm going to talk about a couple of specific projects. One is called WOK, the Business Research Kernel, which is a Microsoft thing, but uh, we were actually first first site outside Microsoft to ever touch it. Um, I, I briefly mentioned case truck, which is the uh, PhD topic of Alexander Schmidt, who is uh, uh, from my group here. And I'm going to mention entries. Those, those are tools and approaches uh, uh, that are focused on um, monitoring and in investigating and running operating systems kernel. And uh, we will extend it this, this, this topic a little and talk about resource management for service computing, which is kind of the cloud computing of yesterday, okay? 
um, so uh, and services uh, was, was just last generation's buzzwords. And then we look into how this can be translated and applied to cloud computing. And we will finally talk about resource management for cloud services. So what is the, the Hasse Plattner Institute? Um, it, is, it is an institute which is privately funded at University of Potsdam. This is quite unusual for Germany, where you usually don't have private institutions. Um, we have a full-blown computer science curriculum, uh, which focuses very much on, on software engineering. And we have this PhD program called uh, Service Oriented Systems Engineering, um, which runs now for five years. Um, Depicted here is Hasso Plattner, who is one of the co-founders of the SAP. So we are living a little from SAP money, which is a good thing. Um, so if you, if you look at, at uh, the pyramid, you see the usual education. Uh, what stands out a little is, is this PhD program. And we have a number of uh, collaborations with other PhD schools in the bigger Berlin area, where there are about 12 uh, schools in, in, in this, in this uh, area alone. Um, and all these students, OK. All these students, they, they focus on, they focus on uh, service-oriented systems engineering. And if you look here, you see the topics of the different shares, which are all looking at these uh, like internet technologies or system architecture from a software engineering standpoint. And the goal of this research school is to bridge among them and basically look at all the different levels of the service stack uh, starting at the operating systems level, going over, over communication and middleware and security and workflow, going to applications, and also orthogonal to this, looking at, at tools and approaches from, for building services in a distributed fashion. So what I basically want to point out is that uh, we, we have quite some background in uh, service computing and uh, research in this area from, from different viewpoints and angles. Um, if, it, if, if we come back to the operating systems middleware group, then our research agenda looks more like this. So uh, kind of anchor point is the middleware. The share is actually called operating systems and middleware. And from middleware, we go down to operating systems with a number of projects, Windows Research Kernel, one of them, um, but also other collaborations with HP, looking into VMS, looking at HP UX, um, also looking into real-time systems. Um, and from the middleware, we go into embedded systems, and we go into wide area distributed computing. Um, which would be service computing or cloud computing. And we have done uh, research projects on the European level, like this adaptive services grid used to be an European integration project, um, but also projects funded uh, by industry. And you see a number of industry partners here. Um, yeah, period. This is basically my background. Now let's, let's talk a little about the operating systems, which become important again. This is actually an interesting thing. If you were talking to a computer science guy like, uh, or to an entrepreneur, even better. Um, if you, there, there, there used to be a platform before eBay became ubiquitous. There used to be a platform called Alando. Alando.de was a German internet uh, auction house. And one of the founders, they, they got bought by eBay. One of the founders gave a presentation at our school and he, people asked, what, what do we need to learn in order to be successful in business? And he, he said, Java and XML. And this was the answer until maybe five years or three years ago. Now people understand that because of this multi-core and multi-threading challenge, computers are not getting faster as fast as they used to get faster. Um, people understand that they look back and need to look back into operating systems, need to look back into computer architecture, need to focus on programming models and so forth. And I think cloud computing is, is one of the uh, tips of the iceberg, where we see new computing models arise. But I also want to propose later on that there is more to come. So programming models, computing models, there is a long uh, road to go. Again, operating systems are becoming important again. Um, if you want to look at, at Windows, uh, then we have put up a web website, which is uh, actually visible from the internet, talking about the Windows Research Kernel. Also, we have done, uh, developed a couple of tools, like one tool called, called Pixar, which does a hyperlinked uh, annotated version of the Windows sources, which is also on the internet. You don't see the, source, the, the URL uh, right, right on the top. And there's this process of signing up and 
uh, basically, um, at some point, you need to send email to Akari. But then, a uh, number of schools uh, already using this. You can access Divino sources and navigate to this and run students' projects and do uh, experimentation um, in the operating system space with, with one uh, important product, maybe. Um, this is just a screenshot showing, showing this, this tool. Whenever you investigate an operating system, you look at the sources, you use tools like a kernel debugger to understand what's going on, and you want to have additional tools which don't interrupt the timing behavior of the system so much like single stepping through debugger. Basically, the biggest challenge is getting a consistent view of what's going on in the operating system. And this is actually a topic which comes back if we talk about cloud computing. Getting consistent view of what's going on in the system is getting more and more uh, important and more and more difficult. And there's more presentations actually on this workshop who look at the topic how to consistently uh, judge about the system. So what is uh, the idea here? Um, carrying out experiments on the system, um, developing tools, developing uh, domain-specific languages to describe certain parts of the system, like data structures, and then automatically generate code, which would be like device drivers, which could be inserted in the system under test to get consistent information out of the tool, of, of the system. This is uh, more or less the PhD topic of, of Alexander Schmidt, and he is going to give a presentation this afternoon where he talks about Skylab. Uh, some people might remember Skylab uh, was famous like 30 years ago. Um, he's giving more explanation why we choose this topic again. The idea is basically uh, using the cloud to build an environment where you can do experimentation with the operating system kernel. So you don't need to run your own test system. You don't need to run uh, set up experiments. You just go to the cloud and find the number of uh, canned experiments, put in virtual environments, together with tools, together with uh, uh, expected observations, like you may remember from, from your school, basically, when you did physics experiments. The next, next thing is called entries. Uh, this, is, this is different research, also carried out at, at our group. Um, and um, as the name says, it, it, is, it is about tracing system behavior. So how can you trace system behavior? Um, typically, you need to insert observation points, insert, modify the code, modify the system on a test. How can you do this? without possibly having sources of the system. And, and here comes a little interesting idea. Um, if, you, if you look at recent editions of Microsoft products, then these editions are so-called hard patchable, um, which means the code is generated following, following certain patterns. And the pattern is whenever there is a function, uh, there is some white space on top of the function. And this white space can be used, and basically all Windows products are instrumented that way or are compiled that way. You need, need to use the, the right linker switches, which is hot patch and function pad admin. Pad admin. Um, and, and then uh, you get the white space, and now you detect the start of a function, that's the idea, and uh, you remove a couple of instructions here, jump to this white space, which you use as a trampoline to do a long jump to your instrumentation code. And then, uh, you basically are off and running doing instrumentation here. So um, from your function, you, you need to detect where function starts. From your function boundary tracing, right? That's the topic. From the beginning of the function, you jump to your uh, trampoline. From the trampoline, you go to uh, some place where you do your instrumentation. Um, and from the instrumentation, you have modified uh, return addresses and so forth. You go back to the original function. Uh, you have modified return addresses, which means you, you have a chance to go back into your call proxy once more to trace the fun function exit as well. And uh, then you're off and, and the system is running as, as before. So we have developed this um, on a binary level for the 32-bit versions of Windows, uh, which is applicable not only to the Windows Research Kernel, but also to the products. So you can trace uh, running your experimental system, but also uh, product retail versions of Windows. And uh, I, I have omitted considerable number of details because um, your computer is 
today being multi-core computers. So it's not so easy to decide when it's safe to modify some piece of code because the other CPU might well execute it in this moment, okay? Next thing, if you know Windows programming, there is structured exception handling. Exception handling is also used inside the Windows kernel extensively, which means that you have basically not only the stack, but you have also exception, in section, exception stack. You have to save not only your stack pointer, but a little more, um, and so forth. So implementation details. But um, in general, that's, this, this, is, this is a method uh, which allows you to trace system behavior on, on a Windows system. These are a couple of projects uh, in the operating system space, uh, current and ongoing research, which we later on want to apply to the cloud. But first, let's, let's look into resource management as a, as a different question for service computing. So in this space we have, which is often, often called green computing today, we have worked with Software AG, Software AG is building middleware in, in Germany, and in, in particular, they, they are building a, a, a thing called Centrosite, which is a metadata enriched UDDI repository. Um, basically, the one place where you want to uh, put all your policy information about how to run certain services, what kind of resources are they do for the services, and so forth. So, we developed and implemented the so-called policy enforcement point for central site, uh, which allows for real-time resource partitioning without changing operating system, without changing application server and the Java runtime and so forth. So central site is a Java thing, but same would apply to uh, .NET as well. Um, and we have to notice that just talking operating system is not, is not enough because runtime environments typically also include application server and, and just additional software. So, what is the idea? Um, we have an operating system and we have something called scheduling server, which is a software developed by us originally on, on the Mach operating system, later ported to Windows NT and to Solaris. And we have also a an, an, an portable version running on, on POSIX kind of systems. And this scheduling server is able to do time slicing, if you will, um, of, of the CPU so that you can give a guaranteed amount of CPU time to certain uh, threads and to certain service invocations. So that's the idea. Here you see the scheduling service principle. Basically you do dynamic modification of, of priorities for threads so that at certain point in time your application, your service invocation is going to get the highest priority in the system and the others are just being suspended or being uh, basically without CPU. And uh, this allows you to give, say, 10% to one service invocation and 20% of CPU to another service invocation and make predictions about how these service invocations will perform. Um, brings up another interesting topic. So and service computing, and to some extent maybe also cloud computing, they are uh, often viewed as stateless operations. So you have to encode everything you want uh, in terms of interface with your, to, to your service in this uh, in the service invocation. There is no state at, at, the, at the server, which is, might be difficult if you want to give um, guarantees. And in fact, if you look at cloud computing today, and in particular in their SLA uh, agreements, and, and um, then, then you see that there is this, uh, uh, a certain difficulty in, in getting guaranteed performance out of, out of service computing, out of cloud computing today. Okay, I mentioned this already, scheduling server, that's the idea. Next idea, if you look at service computing and also at cloud computing, um, it's no longer that there is a single invocation, but you have workflows. So you want to use this knowledge about the workflow and about how things uh, interrelate inter and feed this back into your execution environment. And the other thing we learned, um, in order to do predictable computing in a service space or a cloud space, you, it's not sufficient to look at one component. But you have to build up a model, which is in this term, uh, in, in this context called service monitoring model, which looks at various levels. At the operating system, which might be Windows or Linux, which looks at the application server, which looks at the uh, runtime environments of, of certain, certain programming languages and so forth. And this is just, uh, uh, an excerpt from, from this monitoring model and where you get the data from. 
Okay, now a few words about cloud computing, and I go quickly here because you probably know this already. So cloud computing came up with, on, or comes in three different flavors. You talk about infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. Infrastructure basically means you run a machine image. Uh, platform means you have programming environment like Visual Studio and Azure, like uh, uh, Eclipse and Google App Engine. Or software as a service, you just use the software. It's like Google Docs or, or Salesforce.com. Um, this forms a stack again, sure, but you want to have it on a pay-per-use basis and you want to have it elastic. And um, then there is a kind of orthogonal discussion and this is about whether the cloud should be public or private. So far, most offerings are public clouds. And inter interestingly enough, the big players like SAP and the IBM, they don't talk about cloud at all, which means they are not talking about public clouds. They are talking about private clouds. They want to have everything behind the fence. And uh, um, my, my kind of uh, understanding of the scene is uh, probably we will end up at something sometimes called hybrid cloud. So there uh, is, will be both. Indicators are right now you can have a VPN into the VMware cloud already so that you have secure communication to your VMware, uh, excuse me, to Amazon, to your Amazon uh, data. Uh, another indicator, if you look at VMware, they have something called vCloud, where they allow you to, to establish layer two connectivity about cloud instances, building closer coupled uh, things inside the cloud. Next interesting uh, distinguishing question is, what is the unit of granularity? So often it's a machine image, but sometimes it's also uh, bigger, like the virtual data center, or it's smaller, much smaller. Sometimes it's even a physical machine. So IBM has something called the resource cloud, where they give physical machines to, come to, to our researchers and have basically a portal for managing this. Next question is, what is the programming model? So we are so much used to web services that we think web services is the answer, and I would assume this might be true for the moment, but will change. Um, also, how do you communicate inside the cloud using service bus, using message passing APIs? This is basically all... Um, like, like the generic solution, but not the optimized uh, solution, in particular not optimized if you look at to, into multi-core and uh, multi-threaded architectures. There's some amazing examples like this Live Mesh uh, cloud application from Microsoft where you just, just share data and don't care. So cloud computing has many beauties, has problems as well with the servers and the form factors and the heat and, but um, we pretend not, not, not need to care about because Microsoft will do or Amazon will do. And I'm not sure how long this true, uh, holds true. I think resource, uh, talking about resource, negotiating resources for cloud computing will bring some of these problems back, back to, the, to the user again. Um, energy consumption, sure. And how does it all come together? So, okay. <laughs> our, our idea is that, that we that we use the scheduling server or something similar for CPU partitioning in, this, in the cloud. We want to use entries for doing local resource monitoring and then generate uh, um, probes which we deploy in the cloud to figure what, what, uh, how, how these systems in the cloud are doing. Actually, um, there's also movement in this space. If you go to uh, VMware, they have something called vProbes, which is basically like uh, D-trace for the hypervisor. So you can instrument write little scripts to understand what the hypervisor is doing and how it gives resources to the different clients and guests. If you want to try similar things on Azure, uh, it's, it's much more difficult. You have to uh, go walk through log files. You have to do it basically post-mortem and so forth. Next thing, as I mentioned, I, I believe strongly that there will be new programming models. Um, and uh, we want to talk about co-location of services again. We want to talk about co-management of parallel activities. Okay, I'll go quickly uh, over this one, talked about already. Yeah, one minute. So this was the part of applying known or previous research now to the cloud. Um, talking programming models, there's a couple of big uh, innovation in the computer architecture field. One innovation is that we will start seeing CPUs which are heterogeneous in terms of having different cores inside the same chip. One example, uh, uh, and, and the other direction will be just having many, many more 
uh, CPUs inside, uh, many more cores in, inside the same CPU which are not connected like today's SMP machines. Uh, examples are the, the single chip cloud computer from Intel. Other examples are uh, systems where we, where we have uh, GPUs, graphical processing units, and CPUs being used as compute units at, at the same time. And OpenCL is a programming language will, which will allow to use this. So idea here, um, you have compute units, and they are, they are different. They are heterogeneous. Uh, some of them are just CPU-like devices. Others are GPU-like devices. Are, others are maybe even different. And uh, this will form one uh, ship in, in the future. And what is not clear today is what will be the memory consistency models? How do you put data there? How do you uh, yeah, keep data consistent? The other, other uh, notable uh, movement is towards per libraries, per computing uh, in, in a ship. So example here from, from Intel, where you have uh, the threading building blocks, and Microsoft is picking up on this with the concurrent runtime for .NET and the Power Patterns library, um, that you basically let the CPU and the runtime system decide how to partition your computation. So in the keynote, we learned about embarrassing, em embarrassingly Perl applications. And certainly, in the, uh, in the field, there are many applications which lend themselves to Perlization easily. However, uh, uh, this has been the case for like 20 years. And uh, um, it turns out that there's also many applications where it's difficult to parallelize and without help of compiler, no chance. Okay, time is over. Last, last uh, <laughs> topic. In order to study all this, we have started building up Future Sock Lab at HBI, which uh, is run by a couple of uh, companies and our institute idea is bringing huge computers, huge in terms of memory, huge in terms of CPUs, and developing uh, and researching all these questions I've mentioned basically in, in this environment. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, I think we are talking about hybrid clouds in the future. So the question will be, how can we unite Azure and public offerings and the cloud in the data center? And just uh, going to the conclusions. Okay, so we have new programming models. We have the multi-threading, multi-course challenge where we need to learn pro power programming again. Um, and monitoring the cloud will be most important to make it successful for, for businesses and for applications. Thanks. Thank you. We only okay. have uh, time for one question. Okay, so any quick question, please? Uh, just one detail. Um, you, talking about your uh, entries, mm -hmm. like this, uh, you were mentioning the fact that you do um, um, uh, resource allocation in real time. Is that correct? Did I understand <laughs> it correctly? Um, this, this end tracing is, is tracing. It's not resource allocation, it's just tracing, function boundary tracing, and, and execution flow. And you were mentioning resource allocation, I heard. I think you, you combined with the, word, with the phrase real time. Um, is this correct? resource allocation. But the, 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 sorry, the, the thing that I spot is that in your slide, you were also saying yes. without changing the Java runtime environment. And yes. I was wondering how can you do real time without changing the Java runtime environment? That starts going garbage collection when you do not expect it. No, no, no. What, what, what I wanted to say is uh, in order to, to um, achieve predictable system behavior, you have to do this resource reservation. And you can apply this to certain runtimes, also to the Java runtime but you won't get any better than the runtime is per se. So if you want a real time, you go with real time Java, maybe you go with other real time or real time environments, sure. But the resource reservation or resource partitioning mechanism has to be able to, to honor the real time requirements of the runtime. I did, not, I did not want to say, and it's surely not true that Java is real time. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Next presentation is on the cloud for University City Campus. This by Professor Daniela Montesi from University of Bologna. Bologna. Bologna, of course. And the reason I paused because uh, Professor Montesi has a very distinguished career. He actually taught in several Italian universities in Portugal. UK and worked in US. 
So he brings a lot of experience, not only as a distinguished uh, scholar and uh, researcher, but also he is a vice dean of his school, and he's thinking here how we can take the new technology and help. So please. Uh. Thank you so much. Um, uh, first of all, a disclaimer, I'm not a cloud guy. I'm a database guy, so you will uh, uh, see uh, in the presentation. Um, well, let me mention that, uh, oh, let me see how to move forward, okay. Um, we know that cloud technology um, is ready to change the way in which we interact with internet service. Um, and I believe that in this context, applications and data will play a fundamental role to test uh, new ideas and to improve and develop the state of the art in cloud computing. Uh, in this talk, uh, um, I'm going to propose the use of cloud uh, to create a virtual university city campus in Bologna, which probably, you know, is the hometown of what is supposed to be the most ancient university in Western world. We are supposed to, we start, we open for business in 1088. And so we think that in, in this case, we can say that uh, the, the past met somehow in the future. So here is a brief outline of, of the talk. I'm going to say, few words about the main actors of this cloud for the university. I'm going to talk a bit about the social, technical, and geographical uh, features of the Bologna University City Campus that we believe would fit into this cloud uh, um, project. And then I will uh, um, sketch the uh, main phases of the project, starting from a pilot uh, uh, down to the extension. And then I will uh, um, mention uh, some, uh, um, I will uh, summarize the proposal. So uh, roughly speaking, this is uh, uh, the architecture of a cloud uh, with uh, infrastructure, platform, applications, user, and uh, their environment. We um, have done a bit of mapping, and uh, we believe that uh, uh, the mapping for the uh, Bologna University City campus is essentially, we assume that the, 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 the infrastructure and, uh, is already in place and also the computing power and the storage uh, is there. What we are more interested in is to see how to map the gray part of the slides, so how to map the environment, uh, the application, the data, and uh, if you want, uh, the developers. So uh, we will uh, look at what are the components of the University City Campus Cloud application, or if you want, why we think uh, uh, we, it could be Bologna a good uh, uh, case study. We have done uh, some uh, uh, preliminary work, uh, and we have identified uh, uh, five, uh, let's say, key elements. One are the users. Uh, another one is the environment, which is not really the computing environment, if you want. Another one is the uh, internet connection that need to be there. The other element is the developers, and then the applications, the data that uh, somehow we expect uh, also to be there. So regarding the first item, the users, uh, the potential users, there are about uh, 85,000 students. Uh, on top of this, we have about 3,000 faculty members and 3,000 mean a technical um, um, person. Plus, we have uh, another, let's say, 3,000 something uh, uh, between external faculty members and, uh, let's say, um, contract collaborators which actually are doing postdocs and so on. And uh, this is, uh, if you want, the user side. Regarding the environment, uh, um, it's important to say that Bologna University is a multi-campus, so it's made of five different campus. One is Bologna, another one is Forli, 50 kilometers south, and then you go travel another 50 kilometers south and you find Rimini, and then you travel 50 kilometers east and you find Ravenna, and then Cesena and so on. These uh, 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 five uh, campus, uh, plus we have, uh, by the way, a unit in Buenos Aires. I don't know why, but it has been there for a number of years now. And uh, these five campus host the 23 faculties and 70 departments. So uh, we are going to talk uh, about the Bologna campus, which is already spread over the city. And here you have buildings which belong to the university, which are alternate with private buildings and uh, uh, public uh, places. So by the environment here, we mean uh, really the uh, physical environment. We have uh, something called Portici, and uh, sometimes we also get some nice weather there. So we believe that this is a good uh, uh, environment in which experiment this virtual campus. 
The other element is that anyway, students already spend a lot of time outside uh, classrooms. Uh, Sometimes, uh, actually, they attend uh, classes even outside in uh, that's a, a square called Piazza Verdi, where you have a, a colleague that is teaching there. This was, I believe, two years ago. But the environment is not enough. We, you, we also need to have a, a network connection. Uh, in the Bologna City campus, uh, let's say, there are uh, two different wireless uh, networks. One is called Hyperbole Wireless, which is the city council uh, wireless network and uh, can be used by any uh, Bologna resident or employees. Then there is another network which is called Alma Wi-Fi, which is a university staff, uh, which is being used by you know, uh, students uh, and the faculty members and uh, all the other people working in the university. And these two networks are actually meshed up, so you can access to one or the other to a kind of single sign-on, and you don't bother where you are. So the network is there, although it's not covering the full city. And uh, there is also the possibility to have uh, the people developing uh, uh, the cloud applications. Uh, this, uh, uh, our university has several undergraduates and postgraduate degrees in computing in the faculty of engineering or, uh, let's say, science. And these students uh, can be obviously users, but can also be developers and coding applications through you know, project works uh, and so on. And actually, the integration cloud technology into uh, developing real application can be also uh, a way to build uh, a competence center uh, uh, on, the, on the subject of, of cloud computing. Um, talking about applications and data, there are already uh, applications, uh, obviously, uh, to running our services. Uh, we have a, a bunch of websites for departments, faculty, degree programs, and so on. Uh, but the main areas that are actually covered are here listed, the research and uh, the teaching side. Uh, uh, there is a, 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 an ongoing project on mobility, and uh, there is a, a vision to also run virtual labs. It's not my own vision, it's the vision of uh, the dean of um, um, our department. And uh, here you find uh, a screenshot of, of um, one of the applications. Uh, each faculty member is respected as a website, to, to interact with the students and so on. But uh, in, in Bologna, we need also to upload all our publications that need to be, uh, let's say, uh, classified according to the impact factor. Otherwise, the university doesn't give us uh, research money. So uh, uh, this is a screenshot of my, uh, one of my pages where I have to upload the, uh, this paper. And these are the papers of last year. And so there is a centralized public uh, database, uh, which is being also used by the uh, research ministry to to rank as, as a department, as a university. Uh, talking about uh, other type of applications, so data here you see an application which is called Alma Esami. It's actually when a, a student takes an exam, then you need to record this exam. You need to sign the exam. Under the Italian law, you need to use a, a digital signature, which is something with a smart card you have to pull inside, and then you record it. I've uh, hidden some information because it's regarding two students that did uh, my exam the exam last, last month. And then we also source the service through Cineca, which is a consortium that is providing us the facility for the digital signature things. So that's an application that is already there, but not uh, on the cloud at the moment. And also, the students can access and can see their own uh, exams, uh, how much they got in terms of uh, marks. They can change, uh, let's say, the curricula, if they want to move into a different uh, uh, curricula, they want to change maybe a new um, course and, and cancel it. Um, on top of this, there, uh, there are some other systems dealing with the administrative things, you know, pay slips and so on. We don't care for the time being about these things. But uh, another mm, good chunk of this system there is dealing with the library system, which is a uh, actually a federated system. It's called the University Library System, which contains a number of uh, uh, publications and uh, online periodicals and so on. And it's um, something that uh, would also need uh, to be moved, let's say, on the cloud. So now let's look at what are the main phases of this uh, project and uh, uh, figure out uh, uh, what are the critical points. Well, uh, uh, phase one is a a pilot, uh, if you want, phase in which, uh, as objective, uh, we need to set up a cloud infrastructure and uh, so make some existing applications available in the cloud, 
as I said, most of all these applications were designed to be available through a website with a standard connection, let's say. Students uh, will access these services without coming uh, in the labs, uh, and uh, only a restricted group of users will use the, this, uh, will be part of this pilot uh, uh, phase uh, and will be mainly computer science students. Um, and then the idea is to move uh, public uh, labs, uh, move labs into public places uh, in uh, different uh, um, uh, locations of the Bologna city campus. And this phase will create the basic infrastructure that could be used then uh, uh, to develop uh, custom application that will be based on existing systems or that uh, will be uh, uh, use the feedback collecting during uh, uh, the following phases. So uh, phase two, after the pilot, uh, there is the phase that we call internal development. In this phase, uh, we still uh, involve uh, uh, computer science students uh, that now became developers. So the objective of this phase is to somehow create and spread the competence that will be needed to develop uh, a more complex uh, um, um, application so for all the other users, uh, not just for the computer science users. And so the developed cloud application in this phase uh, will belong to these two classes, uh, general application need by, that would be decided by students and instructors using this uh, Web 2.0 feature or collective intelligence, if you want. And uh, the other class would be to move uh, into the cloud uh, other applications that were or that are actually already available, but not uh, in the cloud. Then after the phase two, there is this phase three called integration, uh, where at the beginning of this phase, we will have already uh, user feedback about things that are working and things that are not working. So if you want the, the pros and the cons of using cloud application. And developers uh, will have the competence in application development. So at this point, we believe that uh, uh, it will start uh, the phase of building application of interest for a wider audience, so for all the students. Uh, um, and uh, obviously, this will involve students and staff members of other departments as well. Uh, and this, this phase somehow uh, is the bridge uh, towards the final step where the first application will be available to all uh, uh, people uh, 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 working in the university. So there is the phase four, which after the phase three that we call the extension, which is actually the deployment uh, and the testing and the monitoring of uh, uh, the service from the current situation that you find the Mark disease and the to be which is uh, tr done through the cloud. So let me say that uh, 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 following this approach, there are a number of uh, opportunities. Well, one of these is to develop uh, an environment and uh, a set of applications that can be applied to several other contexts, uh, obviously other universities or other, let's say, environments with similar features. <laughs> Uh, this will allow to deal with real application uh, uh, and so to test the uh, potential area of new development and uh, also uh, research for people working in the um, cloud computing uh, search area. And then to prepare or if you want to form students uh, with a strong competence on the cloud, uh, giving them all the necessary tools uh, to understand how if you want uh, develop applications uh, in this environment. Uh, besides these uh, positive uh, elements, there are some critical aspects. Uh, the critical aspects uh, are listed here. The first one is uh, privacy and data location. Under the Italian law, uh, we are required as a public administration to have a complete knowledge uh, on the location of data. So for instance, uh, last year, we tried to outsource the email system of our 85,000 students to Google. Uh, we, we opened a tender. Google and other uh, companies came and said, well, we can do it. But there was a specific item said, we need to know for each email that is being sent or received through these uh, email accounts where the data is located. Because we need to know which is the legal uh, environment uh, that we have to deal with. They couldn't give us uh, a precise indication of where all the messages were. So we have to drop this um, opportunity. 
and we need to keep in mind the same things for the cloud. Uh, the other uh, critical aspects that is uh, acceptance, although it appears that uh, people would love and would like to use these technologies, somehow change is always a risk, so we need to uh, deal uh, properly to manage this um, risk. Uh, among the other things, there is the issue of the network, uh, let's say coverage. People is uh, expecting to have a full coverage now with mobile things, 3G things, they expect to have everything everywhere. So this is instead is a Wi-Fi network, so it's located in some areas of the city campus. So people coming by train are expecting to access the network before they arrive there. So obviously they will use the classic 3G or in the near future the classic 4G network, which is outside our reach. Uh, the, and uh, linking with this issue, there is the mobility element. We already have a, a project funded by Vodafone which is actually uh, already uh, trying to move, moving some, to move some application uh, in order to be accessible from a, a mobile device. But we have already seen that there are a number of issues which uh, need to be reconsidered. But anyway, this is a path that we should uh, traverse. Uh, so uh, with cloud or without cloud, it has to be done. OK, let me summarize our proposal. I hope to be in time. And, um, uh, well, first of all, here the proposal uh, to build a university city campus based on cloud technology. And the objective is obviously to, to do it uh, for uh, the good of uh, uh, the students and the faculty members and everybody that is uh, working around this project. But the issue is also to test and develop uh, uh, these techniques in a real uh, environment. Uh, and uh, we believe that uh, Bologna is uh, a nice place where to do it. And uh, the other element is that uh, we think this uh, system building uh, through, uh, you know, uh, divide the timber, if you want, uh, developing into small uh, um, chunks and, and small phases, uh, and use the uh, uh, computer science students uh, to gradually uh, reach all the objectives of the proposal is also um, something that could be interesting uh, and uh, to experiment. Okay, thank you so much. Questions? I have a question. Do you think the government, uh, governmental laws will change around governance and student identification? It seems to be, a, it to be a challenge for all of us as we go to a cloud and, and using uh, security and governance as a, a blocker for regulation. Well, um, usually, yes, laws do change, uh, do change with uh, new government. Uh, it appears that anyway, they tend to become uh, more restrictive instead than uh, if you want more open. Uh, it appears that we have a privacy law, so I've been told by our lawyer in the university, our colleagues in the faculty of law, that is uh, supposed to be very good, uh, although quite strict. Uh, and uh, anyway, we would like to have a different uh, legal environment, uh, but we have to face what is in here. For instance, this issue of uh, digital signature. I don't know, I mean, when I was uh, working in the UK, they didn't have, okay? I was just, you know, filling an Excel form, A, B, C. This was the grade. You, you stick one of these out of your door. You give another one to the secretary. It's done, OK? It was very nice and very simple. When I moved to, to back to Italy and actually to Bologna, I have to face these things with this little card and then with the USB driver and the Java running machine, which is not the correct version. Then this, this uh, browser is not the one that we are supporting and so on. Uh, I would love to. To remove all this, I, I, I cannot, I should say. These things are digital signature. It's something which is, I believe, much bigger than obviously Italy. It's the EU things, but also in the United States, in a, diff, in a number of states, is 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 being used. It's also uh, uh, used, uh, I believe, in uh, other environments like you know hospitals where you know MD they need to to put down things and so. So I didn't answer to your question, but <laughs> so I'm sorry. So, no, I think it's a great project. Um, I'm interested in knowing the status of it. So it's a proposal. So has the university approved this? And when are you hoping to start phase one? Well, the mobility has been approved and founded outside uh, the university budget. And we are looking actually to complete the other part, if you want the cloud part. 
in the WhatsApp timetable? Well, for the mobility is uh, about 18 months, although few services will move so that it could be accessed from, uh, the, 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 let's say, a small device, because there is also an issue of reorganizing all the content for a mobile device, which is a big effort. It's uh, you know, an ed editing effort, if you want, somehow. Yes. What about privacy issues? Uh, isn't the university uh, worried about um, privacy on the cloud? This seems to me to be the greatest factor hindering the move to cloud. Well, as I said, if you take uh, Gmail as an example of a cloud, which is not, but anyway, as an example of a, a service for which you don't know where actually your data are physically stored. You don't know if it's done in Sweden or in Ireland. Uh, in that case, the, 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 we have been told we cannot do it. So they put on, uh, on paper that we need to know the location of all the data. So for us, cloud it means that it could be everywhere on the national territory. So you could put the data server in Turin, in Rome, in Milan, in Florence. You can move the data here and there. But if it, but, but the, I mean. My university requires that we have accounts for the students. Uh, in our no, no, we have to drop the Gmail offer because they, were, they couldn't tell us for each message being sent and received where this message was, under which jurisdiction, if it was in Sweden, in Ireland, in England, or in Finland. So since they couldn't say where they was, because they told us that even them, they don't know where they are, because they were <laughs> a system which is uh, redundant and uh, organized in such a way that they don't know where are all these messages. So we say, well, we are sorry. And actually, they, they called themselves uh, outside of this project. It's huge. It's huge. It's huge. They forward to Gmail, all of the students do, but we have to keep making it down to them. There seems to be two issues here. One's very political. Yes. And the other is the technology. I don't we could argue that the that the cloud services I think would be um, student records are better served in cloud service than they are being floated around campus somewhere. And the, the example you gave, the paper based, I mean, that's not secure at all. We've seen many, many um, breaches of, of identification in the United States around just that very issue, being very loose around identification. But to me it's really a, a political issue that um, as you're traversing the, the globe, a lot of countries do not want to have their name, the, 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 the records sent to somewhere else other than in their geography. So that's a political issue. Okay. And I'm wondering if that's the, that, that, that to me is the, the obstruction here, not necessarily the technology issue, it's a social issue. Yes, indeed. Uh, you are pretty right. Can yeah. add something? Uh, you say political, I think it's legal really. That is to say that uh, the, if, if, if my mail is stored in Australia rather than Italy, uh, and maybe the, the, the privacy law in Australia differs from that which is applied in Italy, I might be unhappy, and maybe my yeah. email can be disclosed. You know, so I think, yeah. It's, so it's, I don't know whether that is political, perhaps, or, or Well, I think it's illegal. all tied up in the politics yeah. of, it's, of, it's it's of not technical. Of legal, yeah. right, it's not technical, it's not <laughs> a point. <Yeah. laughs> okay, last question, please. Thank you very much. Thank you to you. Our last presentation of this session is on cloud computing project in engineering. This uh, submission is also by two professors, from uh, two professor from Columbia. Uh, the uh, by <coughs> Harold Castro, who will be doing presentation, and Jose. Hernandez, who is a co-author. Both are uh, distinguished scholars and uh, researchers as well. Uh, Professor uh, Castro, who is who will be doing presentation, is uh, professor in computer science of University of the Andes, and uh, he is involved in both teaching and research. As a researcher, he is director of a uh, COMET group, and his colleague is uh, also uh, director of another group. And what they show is actually a synergy of putting together computing and engineering. Um, please. Thank you. Okay. okay, I'm going to present this evolution of the, of the, of the work we have been doing in Universidad de Los Andes. 
Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce you the context. What the what is our universe? How it's in our our university is, and why are we working on these kind of projects? And then, how do we get to the point where we are? Uh, so, for 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 doing this, I have to present the my idea of how the problems, the, which are the problems faced by universities and especially and speci specifically computer science departments, uh, how do we approach these problems, and how do we, are, we are, how are we supporting our uh, solution on, the, on, a, on, on a cloud strategy. Finally, we, I will present the projects we are working on. Um, well, first of all, Universidad de Los Andes is located in downtown Bogota, and it's a private university. Uh, that's an important issue. Which uh, its main school is the engineering school. Within the engineering school, we have a system and computing department. It's not a computer science department. It's not science, it's engineering. And that means that our focus will be to produce solutions that will be uh, implementable in our context. In my mind, in my, my idea of a university and Universidad de Los Andes is a good example for our context, we have to do both uh, two tasks, research and education. That's clear for us. Uh, we, are we have to, to present results on both directions. To do our research, we will need computer power any, in, in any field. Uh, we, have, we have seen this in the keynote. We need computer power and data management. Uh, we want to do our research to be faster, more accurate, bigger, in, in big collaborations and, op and, uh, and optimize the scarce resources we have. And in education, and I'm, when I mean education, I will think especially on computer science or computing and systems, systems and computing or whatever the name in, in, in English will be. We, have, we need experimental laboratories, experimental that will be flexible, but that will be real. Our students need to have access to the latest technologies, but those technologies that are being used by the industry, not the traditional open source solutions that we, can, we tend to use in, in universities. And of course, it has to, to optimize the, the resources we have. So our research at, at Universidad de Los Andes is organized in a, in a federal, Universidad de Los Andes is a federal organization. That means that each school has its own resources and the research they do is limited by the computer, by the resources they have. They, there's no uh, campus-wide resource for research. So uh, science, uh, and not only the science school, but the biology department in, at the science school, they have their, and their own resources. And I will say that each faculty will have its own resources that he can use. We are working on several international projects, and so we need the, the tools to collaborate in, on, on these projects. And it's clear for us that the worldwide, tre worldwide trend is to go in this direction. So we need to set up uh, something that we call the Campus Grid Uniandes Initiative because to do our research in these uh, conditions, the grid is widely accepted to be the, the way to go. So we started this initiative in 2007. It was led by, by science, but in the, the engineering school of my, my department, it's computer and science. Uh, science, science and computing, systems and computing, and the DTI. The DTI is uh, the Information Technology Office of the University, and this was the first time that, the, that this division will be involved in an academic project. Traditional, they have been uh, supporting the administrative uh, processes, processes of the university. They have the web city to have the academy and all this stuff, but they don't. They they are not usable for research or for labs of the, of the academy. So they, they only, they are to support the infrastructure. Uh, 
We need uh, an initiative that, that, that will be linked to the world using the, our local internet to connections. Uh, in Colombia and all Latin America, we have this Red Clara, which is the internet to uh, approach for Latin America. In Colombia, we have Renata, which is the way we have to link to this Red Clara. And so we decide to use this infrastructure, which is not as not very big, but it's but at least it's connected to the internet to and to Giant in Europe. And now we are connected to this, we, as we are part of the CMS project of the LHC in Europe, we are connected, our site is, is currently connected to EEG, to EILA, which is the uh, initiative for a grid between Europe and Latin America, and is or, already working. The ROC LA, which is a uh, high energy physics solution for them. And we are working to uh, develop and we are working to be linked to the OSG initiative here in the States and Gisela, which will be the new ELA uh, uh, project in Latin America to build a generic Greek grid for all the institutions in Latin, Amer Latin America. We have a national projection of this, of this initiative at Universidad de Los Andes. We, will lead the, we, are, we are leading the Grid Colombia initiative to build the, a national grid initiative in Colombia, and for that we are hosting the Colombia Certification Authority. And the mandate from the, for, from the university, from, from the university will, was to focus on new applications. They know that grid is great for physics, but uh, they asked me especially to work with new uh, schools to find new applications, new users, to build our infrastructure for the whole university and not only for the science, uh, uh, for the physicists, uh, in fact, for the physics. Uh, so I start to work with by, by guys from bioinformatics, optimization, in industrial engineering, computational chemistry, and different new projects. This is the, the status, the current status of, of the initiative. We, had, we have the central grid hosted by the DTI, so the, the information office of, of, of the university, linked to CMS, EG, soon to the OSG. We have storage, uh, processing, it's a, a medium-sized cluster. And the big idea will, was to link the resources from other units at the university. So we have here a 20 core cluster here, they had uh, several servers, uh, bioscience, they have also their own resources. And uh, in engineering, we didn't have big clusters, in, in fact. But uh, ISIS, which is systems and computing, my department, we had computer rooms, labs, that we know that they have a lot of available uh, capacity that can be used in this context. And that was, was our work our next work. Then we wanted to increase our com the computed power, but remember I said at the beginning, Universidad de Los Andes is a private institution, and being a private institution meant in Colombia not too, many, not too much money for research, but a strong uh, scheme for funding the uh, education activities. Because most of our budget comes from the fees, the tuition fees from the students, all the money have to go back to, the, to, this, to these students. Uh, our, um, most of our students are undergraduate students. So computer labs are very widely present in our campus. We have more than two or 3,000 machines available for them. But for research, there's some, there, there are very big difficulties. We have a National Science Foundation agency in Colombia, but their budget is really nothing compared with, with any developed country. So uh, the university from time to time does big investments. So last, three years ago, they built a new building for the engineering uh, school. They invest, invested $20 million, million dollars in labs and, uh, and infrastructure. But that's, that's a thing that we know we are not going to have again in the short term. So we have the labs, and now we have to, to be sure to find new ways to fund 
our research. And uh, to find funds, I have to attract new users if I want to, to convince the directors of the university to keep investing in this initiative. Uh, it, but it's difficult, be, it's difficult because of the inherent, inherent complexities of the of grid system, because of the rigid architecture that we have to, to set up to compliant with international uh, standards. And because the fi finally, not all the applications are, are parallel, are easily parallelizable, but even if they are, someone have to, has to do the job. So uh, taking all this into account, we we extended the, our concept of Grid Uniandes initiative to UNAGRID, which is a, um, a step forward to use the opportunity uh, to build an opportunistic grid around the uh, around the campus and try to solve all the all other other issues that we that we are facing right now. UNAGRID is then a uh, what is what is called a desktop grid, a volunteer computing system introducing uh, a new concept in, uh, for us, which is customized virtual cluster, what our, our, idea, our, our idea is, okay, every research group is used to have a, spe a specific environment. We need to reproduce the same specific environment in the available infrastructure. I don't want the, uh, a researcher to learn a new environment. I don't want to force them to learn Condor or uh, MPI or, what, or, an, or, a, or a new specific environment. I will say I, I will better reproduce the uh, specific environment they are used to work with using virtualization and priority management on the computer labs. And we can, uh, and, and using some de dedicated servers to build, to represent the master role in a, in a typical cluster, we can ensure that the uh, quality of service that they, were, they are going to receive is acceptable for, for them. We developed the, the web interfaces to give access to this infrastructure to both administrators and regular users. And, uh, we, yeah, and we start developing projects on, 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 on so following this idea. Then, uh, when looking at the education that we are doing at our department, we, uh, we found that we wanted to get our students to be exposed to as many technologies as possible, but also on environment as real as possible. So we developed the Software Architecture Laboratory, which used the idea of, of we agreed with, with where the customized virtual cluster. Why should, the, the idea here is we build five uh, enterprises, real enterprises, well, quite real enterprises, two manufacturing enterprises, one producing uh, furniture and one, uh, uh, another one I don't remember, which is the, the, I think that is a milk process in industry. A telco company, a bank, and a university. We know this business, so it was quite easy. We sign agreements with the real vendors of the products that, they, that, that are being used in Colombia and, and everywhere. SAP, Seabolt, PeopleSoft, we convince these people that, that we can set up a laboratory where they can take their customers and show real implementation and, and real uh, solutions working on real uh, platforms. So they helped us, they gave us the licenses, and they came to the university to install and to configure these uh, uh, technologies on these uh, industries. And we use different platforms to, to, to set up this infrastructure, uh, also with agreement that we have with Microsoft, IBM, Oracle, and of course we also have open source solutions. Uh, then uh, we started to, to try to, to mix both worlds, research and education. We found that we had two different users, system administrators, uh, who, wants, who has some difficulties to, do the, to achieve their work 
on these kind of platforms, users who want to achieve their, their solution not being aware of the platform that is involved. So we develop, that is the kind of interfaces, web interfaces that uh, we, we developed for both uh, administrators to set up computer labs and to deploy these customized uh, cl virtual clusters. And for researchers, so they can ask uh, the number of machines they want to deploy and the time they are going to use them. And they can go and monitor where are the machines that they are really using, the physical machine that, that they are using and how their projects, the, their work is progressing. And we found diff new, new difficulties. The administration is very, very difficult. The, the, the manual deployment of a, of a virtual cluster, the IP assignment, we have, a, we have public, uh, public addresses, but that because we, ha we have it, but it's difficult to, uh, to, as to assign this, this IP addresses to the virtual machines. We don't have any accountability of, the, of what is going on, on on these platforms. And users complains also because their interface is not natural for them. And we have, we, we have to re-engineer all the project. And what was the answer was cloud. The, the cloud ideas were to the res come to the rescue because they have, cloud have inherent Character, characteristic that are very good for what we are doing. We were already using some of them, virtualization, customized environments, on-demand the, on deployment, delegate administration, at least a little bit. Uh, users don't care about how this customized virtual cluster are operated, but there are some others that can be integrated at, that we, use, we see that can be very useful. For example, on-demand configuration, and here I'm thinking on a faculty uh, expressing the kind of, of, of scenario that should be used by, their stu by his, his students. Uh, I would like to have physical machine transparency. Uh, right now, we, you, you must know where is going, where, which computer room is going to be used. I need accountability, I need new advanced administration tools and, and different complex uh, uh, cluster configurations. So uh, we think on Clouder, which is uh, the, the name we gave to, to this project, which is an opportunistic cloud computing implementing an uh, ES um, service model. We started the development of, of this Clouder to make it as close as possible as the uh, researchers are used to use when they think on the, on, a, on, on the needs of a computing platform. So they have to express the kind of operating system they want to use, which kind of uh, research they are going to work with, and then the applications, a specific application they want to start. And uh, with this idea, we started different we identified three different kind of projects that we are going to set up on this, on this cloud. Uh, the traditional cluster-based research project, which uses the master slave model, some number crunching interactive project because we are, uh, the, my colleague who wrote the, the abstract with me, is working on how to, visual, to, to have high performance visual, visualization uh, for, 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 for his work and these dynamic scenario projects for the computer architecture lab laboratory. Uh, so we started that. We have some results right now. We have working with the laboratory for, bi for bioinformatics and they are doing DNA sequencing using our opportunistic resources. And when we mix now dedicated, they have a cluster. We can mix both the dedicated and opportunistic resources and the, for them, the, the model is the same. I have the traditional cluster, but they won't know that this, this cluster is not really, ex, doesn't exist, doesn't exist. They are going to send all, this, all their requests to the, to, the, to the cloud. And 
if everything go, goes well, the cloud will solve the, the, the problem. Right now, it's not that uh, transparent. They, have, they know where it's going to be executed. They don't have all the facilities, but uh, we are working on it. The visualization team, they expect to have an, a big facility to do their number crunching and a local facility to deal with the visualization problem. And visualization, we are meaning some things like that, different screens uh, integrated and crunching in parallel uh, with collaboration tools uh, within, the, with, within the same uh, environment. And again, uh, we are now doing this not in a cloud transparent way, but we are asking our friends in Alberta, they have a big cluster to solve the, the, the processing and, this, and, and, this, and manage the data. Uh, we receive through internet to Red Cloud and all, the, uh, all this network infrastructure. The results, uh, we locally manipulate the, 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 the scenes that we are receiving and, uh, and we achieve this kind of visualization in our facility. And for the multi-scenario projects, we are imagining then that a, a, a faculty will decide which is the environment that they want, they, he, he wants to uh, produce for his, his students. For example, he will say, okay, I have the uh, bank here, the university here, the manufacturer here, I, we, I want to using SAP, using Seable or whatever software he wants to and to produce the, the scenario they want the students to work with. And set, once they, he configured this, this, this project, students will come and deploy this, this scenario on, on demand on using the, if the opportunistic infrastructure we have. We, we are doing right now using the DKD servers, but we are on, on it. That's it that I want to say. So it's okay. Thank you. <laughs> we have time for questions, please. Um, we, we are trying to do something similar to what you have described, and we haven't started yet, but it's part of the project that my colleague Danilo was describing before your talk. Um, one of the things we are, we are trying to assess, I mean, the, the sort of model we have in mind is that uh, the, the, uh, you as a professor enter a room with 80 students and uh, you teach a lecture, you have, you're lecturing on middleware systems and you ideally would like that uh, they uh, download uh, all the software technology they require to uh, follow your lecture and, and exercises, say application service and stuff like that, mm, by magic. That they do not have necessarily on their uh, laptop. Uh, so it sh should be downloaded uh, from uh, some uh, magic cloud. Uh, what we are trying to assess is how much bandwidth do we need. <laughs> I was wondering whether you had some sort of first hand experience on that. Yeah. Uh, right now, at the beginning, we use a, a NAS server to, to have all the, all the images, and it doesn't work. It simply doesn't work because because uh, they are very heavy. And remember, we wanted to use that, that on the on computer labs. So what we had to do was to have a local copy of each image on each computer room, computer on their computer lab. That is feasible because uh, our machines, as I said at the beginning, are are paid with the tuition fees for students. So I, they, they ask for good machines. So we invested in nice machines with a lot of, of disk and RAM. So I'm taking 100 gigabytes of this RAM to store a local image of each one of these uh, image that they are going to use. Yes, yes, exactly. Which makes difficult the deployment. That's, that is where our next step is how to deploy that easily. But right now we are we are doing this, which is very difficult. And because the problem that I said that of the IP assignment, you have to change it. So we are working on how to how we can 
assign the IP address at the moment of at, at the boot uh, uh, moment, and the other problem will be to how to deal with these local copies that we have to maintain, yeah, maintain coherent. That's that's a difficult. But right now we are lo doing local. But each each image is around two three gigabytes, meaning that we have forty images with no problem. No nobody. Is, is, is missing that giga, those gigabytes. Does that mean you have, you have a limited number of, of uh, laboratories which are equipped? Yeah, yeah. Because we were wondering how to expand this model to the entire university. As we have a right now, we are, I'm using the, the, the best laboratories to do so. And if I, I'm, I'm successful with this, the, the, when, when the new project, I will go to the other labs. But that will be a difficult issue. More questions? I would like that we have a similar situation. Uh, with, uh, we're also working heavily with, with uh, virtual machines. And usually the, the system administration pushes all these images down to the uh, PCs, perhaps the day before you need it. So uh, they are quite happy with that. We've been using this uh, approach since two years, and it works very well. Uh, you have 24 hours, say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have to no, plan ahead. If you <laughs> a little bit, say, at least. Several days before the system administration, they can automatically deploy it uh, on, the, on the PCs. It, it becomes a problem of planning ahead. Uh, we have this system that deploys images automatically. The only problem is you have to figure out what images you need in advance, uh, which is quite uh, problematic. I wonder if that doesn't defeat a little bit the purpose of the cloud on the other hand. Sorry? Uh, you know, the, the solution of deploying uh, virtual images to this machine, I think it uh, kind of defeats the purpose of, 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 of a cloud environment. Ah. On the other hand, like, yeah. like, I have a cloud, but I don't really have a cloud since I, I have to provide for all these local images. Uh, yeah, that, that's right. But that, that, that's because the, the kind of infrastructure we are going to use otherwise. Yeah, and I, and I think it's specific to university because we have different labs all the time. In a commercial environment, you don't really change the image as often. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe this is kind of a university solution. Mm -hmm. uh, more questions? Thank you very much, and thank you to speakers. Thank you. So there is a